everyone. Um, in today's discussion, I'm dealing with a topic that comes up quite frequently and it is quite a contentious one, and that is um, the use of nitrate versus no, not using nitrate at all. Uh, moved me to today's session it was just a discussion that ensued on our Facebook group, um, Cure Smith's Aged and Cured Meats. Um, we'll get into in a couple of minutes. Um, I just want to say that I did write a full article on this particular subject, uh, which is posted on our website, www.curesmith.net. Um, I would like to invite you to join our Facebook group, Cure Smith Aged and Cured Meats. Um, I'll provide the link here with. Um, and on that group, we have roughly 40,000 members, ranging from very experienced Cure Smiths right down to newbies. And it, it really is a great forum for people to share their experiences, share what they've cured, share recipes, and then obviously to gain knowledge, ask questions um, and, and the like. But the one thing that I find with many of the forums is that obviously because you've got a range of, of skills, you usually get a range of answers. And on something like uh, the use of nitrate versus no nitrate, there's some quite interesting viewpoints that, that come up. And what I try to do is look at the science and then to generate my viewpoint from that rather than just going to these forums and seeing what everybody's written and then trying to sort of disseminate from that. So what's great about this forum is that it can steer you into a direction. But what I do urge you to do is um, when reading through some of the comments um, or suggestions that are made, is to then go and do a bit of extra research and make sure that doing is then supported by science. It's, there's no point in, in following a viewpoint and it's not really based on science. We have got extensive um, tools available to us in modern times to be able to research this information. And it is quite exciting and interesting to actually delve into the science and really understanding what is happening under the surface of the meat. But firstly, let's, let's start off the, the discussion about why we do use nitrate in cured meats. And, and predominantly we're using nitrate when we are making dry cured sausage or we're smoking meats. And, and the reason for that, I'm not going to go into the, the, the exact science, there, there's enough material available on, on the website and on the forums uh, to explain this. But basically we use nitrate uh, specifically when we are curing dry cured sausages or whether we're smoking meat. And the reason for that is, is both those scenarios create anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic be, means basically conditions where oxygen is not present. So pathogenic bacteria like Clostridium botulinum uh, become active in anaerobic conditions. So really when there's oxygen around, they remain dormant and they are, are of no danger to us. But as soon as they're exposed to an anaerobic environment and they are present, they will become active and then that is how we, we get something like botulism, which we know is a really severe and dangerous um, condition uh, or illness, um, probably resulting in, in death. So that's one of the primary reasons why we're using nitrite. And nitrite, again, we can look at the scientific um, reasoning for this, which we will explain in future videos. And, and also it's available on our website. Um, but but um, nitrite is basically one of the only com compounds or components that we can use to combat something like botulism. Um, nitrite is also effective against other pathogens uh, like Listeria, Salmonella, E. coli and the like. So that's why it's a good thing to use. Um, in, in dry cured sausage, obviously, if, if those pathogens um, present on the surface, they might be dormant because of the oxygenated um, environment. You then ground the meat down, mix it all up, and then stuff it into ca sausage casing. So that pathogen that was on the surface and couldn't penetrate into the muscle is now mixed into your force meat and is now stuffed into uh, a sausage which creates the anaerobic environment and then becomes the perfect. You're now hanging it in uh, um, uh, your curing chamber which is roughly 12 to 14 uh, Celsius and relative humidity of 75. So you're creating the perfect environment for, for these pathogens to start prol proliferating and um, doing what they do. <coughs> So, and then, you know, smoking meets the same thing, the, the, the um, carbon dioxide, uh, um, you know, when you're smoking the carbon dioxide in the chamber, the smoking chamber basically 
chews up all the, uh, for want of a better term, eats up all the oxygen or a lot of the oxygen. So it creates a, an environment with very little oxygen. And again, at the temperatures and the extended periods that you cold smoking, particularly for, um, it just creates the perfect breeding ground for, for these pathogens. So nitrite is really important when you are um, making dry cured sausages and, and um, smoking meat. But what about whole cured mussels like coppers and uh, lonzo and prosciutto or hams um, and the like, uh, pancettas? What about those? So as I've explained uh, earlier, because the the pathogens sit on the surface of the meat, they cannot penetrate the muscle and they're in an oxygenated environment, they be, remain dormant. So you can take that meat, you can hang it in your curing chamber and nothing will happen. You can consume it. If they're sitting on the surface, you can consume it. Nothing can happen to you because they're not, they haven't become active and they haven't produced the dangerous toxins that affect us. So from that point of view, it, it really is irrelevant. So that's why in many of the whole muscle uh, cures, you, you do not require nit nitrite. So the only reason why Kyrsmus will use nitrite when curing whole muscles is for color retention or color enhancement. And it gives us that nice reddish pinkish color of cured meats and also for flavor enhancement. So how much nitrite is required? How much nitrite are we using? Um, when it comes to the prevention of pathogens, um, the recommended dosage of nitrite is 120 to 200 parts per million. Uh, many of the government agencies or the food agencies around the world have pinpointed that to around 156 parts per million um, of nitrite is enough to combat uh, things like botulism or the Clostridium botulinum uh, bacteria. Um, for color retention and flavoring, we only really need to add 50 parts per million. So I, I want to give you that because it, it, it's, it's important for our discussion down the line. Okay, so now that we've, we understand why we're using nitrite, let's, let's get into the discussion that ensued on our Facebook group. The question that was posed didn't really have anything to do with nitrite per se. It was more to do with, with the humidity issue. Um, the, the meat had uh, clear signs of case hardening, and that is obviously a sign that there's not enough humidity in the curing chamber. And um, some of the suggestions were that the uh, gentleman who posted the question should use second maturation or equalization um, to, to help with e equalizing the moisture um, in the meat uh, and, and which will help with the case hardening. So what, what, what do I mean by that? Effectively, second maturation is, is fairly similar to uh, wine, to the process used in wine. And again, for those of you who don't know what second maturation or equalization is, if I look at the example of wine, um, we have uh, the, the winemaker makes the wine, puts it's kept in the vat for a specific amount of time for, to, to, to mature, um, and then it's bottled, and then it's recommended that the wine remains in the bottle for an extended period of time to get to the perfect flavor profiles that that wine should have. Um, and that could be anything from a year up to a few years that the bottle, you know, that the wine uh, remains in the bottle and, and goes through second maturation. So the similar process in meat curing. Um, we've cured our meat, we now take it, we hang it in our maturing chamber and we wait for our, our target weight loss. Uh, once that is done, we harvest the meat from our maturing chamber and now we can either consume it or we can enhance the flavor even more by doing a second maturation or the equalization process. We do that by taking the meat and we vacuum packing it. We remove all molds and anything on it and we then vacuum pack it. We can add additional um, aromatics to it to enhance a second layer of flavor or to produce second flavor notes. And then it's vacuum packed and it's put straight into the fridge and there it can remain uh, for an extended period. I mean, some, some uh, meats are left for a year, two years in, in, in uh, the refrigeration for second maturation. So how does this relate back to what our subject line is, nitrate versus no nitrate? So, so when I first learned about this um, second maturation process or this equalizing process, which is probably about six or seven years ago, um, it got me thinking because as we know, nitrite is not really necessary for whole cures. And I never used to use nitrite when curing my whole muscle meats. But when I learned about the process of um, equalization, 
it immediately got me thinking, well, hang on, you know, we're taking the meat that has been cured. That's great. We're not taking it and we're putting it into a, a vacuum, um, removing all the oxygen and we're putting that into the refrigerator for extended periods. Um, and that creates an anaerobic environment. So, so if the pathogen was present on the surface of the meat, even through the curing process, the salt, we know that, that things like Clostridium botulinum can, can survive severe conditions. So what we, we so that the simple salting process that we've used on our, our dry cured meat is not going to render it inactive if we put it into an anaerobic environment. So now we stuff the meat into an anaerobic environment, put it in our fridge, the fridge goes down to, minor, to, to, to 3 Celsius. And so we've created a perfect environment for this thing now to become active. So that's the conundrum. So I posted on this particular thread that, you know, yes, second maturation can assist with uh, equalizing the moisture and in, in, in many cases uh, negate or at least alleviate the problem of case hardening to a certain extent. But in the, in the original um, posting of the, 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 the gentleman, he did specify that he did not use nitrite in curing the copper. So that's what I said, is, is that obviously you're now vacuuming this and you just need to be careful and cognizant of the fact that it's now going into an anaerobic environment. You don't have nitrite, so there is a risk. Um, again, you've got a lot of people that comment on that and say, yeah, but it's gone through salting, but it's, salt is not going to help. Again, I, you know, I've pointed out that these pathogens are, are, have evolved to, to survive severe conditions. So this, this also got me thinking further because one of the more scientific approaches to curing, um, and again, with curing, I mean the first part of the pr process where we're salting the meat, that is called the curing. The entire process is not, yes, we, we're creating cured meats, but the first part of the process is curing and then it goes into maturing. So the, the, the first process of curing, we have a far more scientific approach, particularly when we're curing whole muscles, uh, called EQ curing or equilibrium curing. And um, that's, that's as opposed to the salt box method. The old salt box method is we take the, the meat, we cover it with salt, and, and so we leave it for basically one day per kilogram of meat. So if you've got a five kilogram chunk of meat, you cover it in salt, you leave it for five days plus one, and that then is, is sufficient um, for the curing or the salting stage. Uh, uh, the problem with that process is obviously we, we don't control the amount of salt. We, we, we have absolutely no idea how far the salt is penetrated. It's, it's really a thumb suck. So the EQ, EQ method uses uh, a ratio of salt, um, any, anywhere between 1.8% of the weight of the meat to 2.5. My go-to is 2%, so you add that to your flavorants, uh, your spices, and whatever liquid you want to add to it, and you then put that on the meat. The meat goes into a vacuum bag, and you vacuum that, and then depending on the, the thickness of the meat, uh, that would then suggest the timing that it remains. So to give you an example, if you're um, curing a, 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 a copper that is 10 centimeters in thickness, you'd probably leave that for anything up to 15 days um, in, in, the, uh, um, in the vacuum bag. It uses the process of osmosis for, for the um, salt to basically draw out the unbound water. The point again that I'm, I'm raising here is that, that when you do this, um, and your recipe says there's no need for nitrite, just remember it's going into a vacuum. So you're creating an environment, despite the salt that you're adding, you're still creating an environment where some of these pathogens can become active. So despite the fact that I never used to use nitrite on whole cured muscles, I now religiously do it because I'm employing the EQ uh, method and I'm employing the, the second maturation process. So it's, for me, it's a vital thing. Okay, so now how does this relate back to our topic? Obviously, I think it's fairly clear. Um, the suggestion was made that the gentleman place this into vacuum bags and, and do second maturation. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the use of nitrite then becomes a requirement. I also just want to highlight this. So Keir Smiths who were using nitrate for color retention and flavor enhancement 
were only really required to use 50 parts per million, as I explained earlier on in the video. Um, but in order to combat these pathogens, we require 156 parts per million. So I now use the ordinary dose or the required dose of nitrite or the cure mix that we need in order to cure the whole muscle. Now, simply put, that way I know it's safe. Back to the argument of nitrite versus no nitrite. So because of my stance on this, I often get people um, commenting or sending me questions or even case studies um, suggesting that nitrite is bad for you. And I, I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but in this particular instance, um, this gentleman contacted me and said, look, he, he doesn't want to produce meats with nitrite. And uh, he then sent me a, a case study uh, that was done in Greece regarding um, the carcinogenic potentials of nitrite in processed meats. So I took the, the um, and I'm, I'm extremely interested by, by these studies, um, but like any study, you really have to read it and understand and, and like I say, compare apples with apples. So I took the case study and the first thing I do is I go to the conclusion, and that usually gives you a quick synopsis of what they were doing and what the findings were. And I just, I just uh, the, the case study is called, I'm going to read it to you, is called the risk assessment of nitrite and nitrate intake from processed meat products results from the Hellenic National Nutrition and Health Survey. And the, the opening sentence of the, the conclusion stated, the median nitrite and nitrate intake from processed meat products estimated as nitrite equivalent revealed that a significant proportion of Greek consumers were at risk of exceeding the ADI for nitrate from the consumption of processed meat alone, mainly that of processed products from pork and turkey meat consumed as part of mixed dishes, more frequently on toasts, sandwiches and pizza. All right, so I really, just from that sentence, I didn't really need to, to go delve much deeper into reading this, this, this um, research because, although I did, but, but it really clearly and concisely suggested what this research was about. And there's just four quick points I want to take away from this, um, which I'll mention here. This to me is very important. Listen to it very carefully. All cured meats are processed but not all processed meats are cured. So like I was saying, I think we have to compare apples with apples here. And I think it's really important that we distinguish between the types of meat that are mentioned in these studies. Invariably, these studies encompass a, a, the broad term of processed meats. And for me, I really think that it needs to be broken down a little bit in, uh, more into processed meats and under that we have cured meats and then we have what we call highly processed meats. Okay, I think the problem of combining cured meats and highly processed meats under one uh, as one thing really is misleading to what it is that we do here. Okay, and I just a, a quick definition of cured meats is, is basically meat that is treated with salt nitrates and a combination um, of these with spices and, and other flavorants to preserve it. Processed meats uh, are, are meats that are transformed through commercial processes to enhance flavors and improve preservation. This category includes processed sausage, like hot dogs, for example, cooked hams, deli meats. It may also have additional ingredients and, and they're often heavily processed. Okay, so that's quite important. The next thing is that I want to mention here is that our bodies are obviously adapted to handling nitrite. We need nitrite. Nitrite is commonly found in many foods, especially leafy greens, uh, um, obviously celery we know, uh, things like beetroot, um, spinach and the like, but most leafy greens have uh, uh, at least a decent amount of nitrate in them, not nitrite, they have nitrate in them. Our bodies are then designed to um, process the nitrate, convert it. In actual fact, the conversion process happens under our tongue, it converts the nitrate into nitrite, and our bodies then produce a nitric oxide from the nitrite. And there, there's several health benefits to this, and one of them is that it acts as a vasodilator. 
um, which basically relaxes and sp expands the blood vessels and which includes blood circulation and, and alleviates uh, blood pressure. So that's one of the benefits. There are a number of them. You can go and look those up. Um, so, so our bodies are adept to, to dealing with nitrate, nitrite and nitric oxide. Okay. So the third point I want to raise, or that I've raised here with, uh, in answering this, this um, study is that, um, yes, we understand that nitrite can be carcinogenic, but we need to look at how it becomes carcinogenic. And um, the way that it becomes carcinogenic, when it reacts with amines to form nitrosamines. And this only happens at temperatures exceeding 130 degrees Celsius. Okay, so dry cured meats, we're not heating. So there's no reaction, there's no nitrosamines that are created. So we don't have that danger. All right. Um, as Kirsmiths, we obviously, a lot of us make bacon, and bacon has become a hot topic, um, particularly the World, the World Health Organization released uh, um, um, studies a, a couple of years ago about the, the, the concerns around bacon and, and cancer because of the, 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 the creation of the nitrosamines at high temperatures. And obviously, when we're frying bacon, it does go to high temperatures. But there's been a lot of case studies to support this. And here I would, I would urge you to go and view a website called uh, Earthworm Express. And I'm going to provide links in the description below uh, to specific articles where uh, my friend Evan van Tonde discusses this very subject of nitrosamines and, and bacon. And quite honestly, it, it really, in my opinion, is not so much of a problem. So you can you can go and have a look at that. But again, in discussing this this particular topic and looking at the study and that that um, blurb that I or the the conclusion that I read out to you, the last part of the sentence is is what highlights for me is is it says mainly processed products from pork and turkey meat consumed as part of mixed dishes, more frequently on toast, sandwiches, and pizza. All right, so that now becomes a bit clearer. I mean, let's take pizza, for example. We put sliced ham on pizza and it goes into the pizza oven. The pizza oven, if, you do, if you've got a, a decent pizza oven, it should be about 450 to 600 degrees Celsius. That pizza, I mean, theoretically should be cooking in less than a minute. But you're heating that meat to quite high temperature. Like I explained earlier, um, we're looking at temperatures of 130 degrees Celsius plus in order to convert nitrate and the, or, to, or to create nitrosamines. So there is a, a prime example where that is probably happening. So again, I can, I can suggest that those types of meats are probably more prone to producing nitrosamines than to what we do, cured meats. So this case study really has nothing to do with our processes, okay? And unfortunately, as I said earlier, we have to liken apples with apples. And that's what happens is, 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 is our, our art form is tarnished by these studies. And, and it's purely because we either we're not reading or understanding exactly which meats they're talking about, or the people out there are just brushing all processed meats with the same brush. And, and as I said, that's just not fair on what we do. The last point I, I raised about this particular um, study, and, and this is something I use throughout, is, is just moderation. Um, you know, if you're going to eat a kilogram of, of bacon every day, you're going to get ill from that. Similarly, if you drink three liters of water a day, it's bad for you. Uh, there's, a, there's a condition called hydronatremia. Um, and this is basically where the sodium levels in our bloodstreams become so low because of the dilution, because of so much water, that it can actually become fatal. So even water, an overconsumption of water is dangerous. And let's take sugar as an example. Our bodies have got an unbelievable organ that has the ability to process or to combat sugar, and that is the pancreas. The pancreas uh, um, creates insulin, which is the perfect thing to, to, um, to process the glucose in our body. But because of our overconsumption of sugar in modern diets and modern food processes, our bodies now cannot, or the, the organ that we have, cannot produce enough insulin to, to process the sugars that we're consuming. And hence, we've got a type 2 diabetes pandemic, particularly in the Western world. So if we, if we just rely on moderation, sugar is not a problem. 
but it is now because we're just over consuming it and unfortunately in today's world it is just about over consumption all right so now let's just tie all of this together in the end um I think for those of you who who have this notion that nitrite is bad for you, I think I think you really have to do some research and not just believe everything that you read. Um, th- there is nothing to suggest that the quantities of nitrite we use in curing um, our meat is dangerous. As, and as we've discussed in this video, um, I think the necessity of using nitrite specifically in the conditions that we operate in far outweighs the negativity of, of that, considering um, everything that we've discussed, considering the scenarios that we're in. In terms of the general production of cured meats and the way that we do them, I honestly personally cannot see that there is any risk um, to, to your health in using nitrite in, in, in the cured meats. Certainly if you apply uh, the stringent um, um, quantities required and you know the modicum of, of um, uh, moderation and everything else that we've discussed. Again, I'm not a healthcare professional. I'm not a research scientist. These are just based on my own observations and reading the materials that are available out there. Um, I would urge you to do the same. Don't just take my word for it. I, I certainly don't take everybody else's word for it when I read stuff. I, I try and go and, and research it as much as I possibly can. Because obviously, you know, we, we are giving our meat to other people to eat and we want to ensure their safety and their enjoyment thereof. And certainly don't want anybody to get ill from eating what we've produced. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to my YouTube channel.